Hey, hey, hey. Well, welcome to this week's lesson preview. Uh, we hope you guys are having a great week. We're obviously jumping into Ecclesiastes. We got into it uh, this last Sunday, uh, as you know if you were there. Uh, really uh, intense stuff, but but good stuff. Uh, and so you probably got the overview in general about Solomon, about the information uh, sort of you know, we, we believe Solomon, you know, is probably the primary writer or somebody close to him was writing down the things he said. Uh, either way, most of, most of this, we think, probably came from Solomon and uh, would have been general. Uh, some of this would have been general sayings and thoughts and, and sort of uh, attitudes that would have been really common in Hebrew culture back then. So Solomon may, in some senses, just been kind of compiling a general body of wisdom and thought and atmosphere uh, in Hebrew culture at that time, uh, in addition to his own observations. So let's do this. Um, let's start off with just uh, some ideas about what you could do and maybe get things going. Uh, I would say the book, as always, I think has really good info in here, uh, especially in the back for, for the leaders, the teachers. Um, and I mean, honestly, if you follow that and that's all you did, you would do a, a perfectly fine job. So again, I'm just going to give you some additional things, some ideas, additional thoughts on the subject matter and the, and the passage that the book doesn't really touch on because you don't need me to tell you the same thing the book says. So, so dig into the book, follow what it says, take people through that if that's what you need. And, um, I would really focus on personally the idea of time because there's so much in this passage, uh, really even in the whole book of Ecclesiastes about time. Uh, and uh, in fact, verses one through eight are essentially a psalm, a song uh, that Solomon composes here about time and seasons of life. Uh, in fact, it's even been adapted, uh, if you're old enough to remember, there's a song by the birds in the, the 60s called Turn, Turn, Turn. They literally took this passage and made it into a song. It was a top, probably top 10 hit, may have been a number one hit on the radio. To everything turn, 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 there is a season, turn, 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 and a time for every purpose under heaven. All that, and you know, they go through a time to live, a time to die, a time to, and so they. This is obviously considered, even by people who wouldn't claim to be believers, uh, to be a passage full of knowledge and wisdom and perspective on life. And so, I would probably start out with my group. If I were teaching my life group this week, uh, I would start out by having them talk about time. And, and really, a cool, easy way to do this would be if you if you want to be a really cool life group leader you could go through and find a bunch of songs <laughs> uh, about time and you could even like play clips of them or something like that uh, I would probably just probably be more prone to just t going around the group and saying everybody name can you name two or three songs about time and and how quickly they'll pop to your head you know whether it's uh you know if I could save time in a bottle old Jim Croce song or uh, the Guess Who's No Time, or uh, Steely Dan, Reeling in the Years, or um, Steve Miller Band, you know, time keeps on slipping, slipping, slipping into the future. Pink Floyd had a, had a song called Time. Uh, Chicago Sticks, Too Much Time on My Hands. There's so many songs that you could just, you could literally start making a long list about time. Maybe the next thing you ask your group is, can you name five movies about time travel? Well, that's so easy. I mean, you start going through and Back to the Future, The Terminator, The Time Machine, uh, Frequency, Interstellar was a really cool movie recently. It had a lot to do about the concept of time. In fact, the whole movie is essentially a concept of what is time and how it's you know relative uh, depending on where you're at in the universe and gravity, all sorts of heady stuff. Um, Old movie in the 80s called Peggy Sue Got Married, Time Travel, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, Time Travel. Uh, more recently, if you're dealing with, especially up the hill, if you're dealing with kids, all the Avengers movies, all the Marvel Comics movies that are out, uh, you know, uh, Avengers Endgame, the main thread through all those was the idea that they could travel through time and manipulate time and affect different outcomes and, and you know, what is the nature of time and uh, is everything determined or can it be changed? Is it inevitable or not? Uh, you know, so, so I mean, it's 
you, you could even go down to like paintings. Like if you start looking through the art world, if you're if you're into that kind of thing, uh, whether it's Salvador Dali's Persistence of Time or uh, Steve Hester Time Travel, uh, Andrew Judd's painting uh, Hands of Time. There, there's all sorts of art out there that deals with the concept of time. Books, you start naming books, The Time Traveler's Wife. Uh, it's a really interesting uh, novel, uh, fiction, dramatic story that has to do with the idea of time travel. Uh, you know, Stephen Hawking, obviously, what's he famous for? What was, what was his, his book? A Brief History of Time. And the whole thing was about trying to determine age of the universe, how time works. Uh, you know, so essentially you could, you could get your class t to realize, but whether it's literature, whether it's art, whether it's movies, whether it's music, human beings are obviously obsessed with the concept of time. It's just built into our brains to wrestle with the concept of time. And, uh, we never really get comfortable with it because generation after generation, continues to talk about in their art, in their music, in their movies, in their literature, continues to talk about time. There's not enough time. Time is short. Uh, life is short. Uh, seasons. It's, it's a constant theme. And so it's interesting because we're obsessed with time, but we're also very uneasy with it. And there's a reason for that. It's in this passage because God. it says that God has put eternity in the hearts of men. So it's interesting because we were created for eternity, not time. And so we deal with time, but we never get used to it because really time is much more of a, a way of understanding our finite place in eternity because outside of the human experience, uh, time doesn't really affect all that much. God is eternal. He always has been. He always will be. He is not. He he does not live inside of time like we do. Uh, I always tell people when they try to think of of how it is that God interacts with with time. In fact, I had a seminary class recently where we were discussing this. Uh, whether you know, as far as how God interacts with the present and the past and the future, and you know, some people have a hard time getting their head around that. And I, you know, I told them I said I think of it like if. All of human history is a straight line, and this is the beginning of the world, and this is going to be the end of it when God wraps all things up. Uh, God does not live on the line. God is out here looking at all of it from start to finish. We are on tiny little dots or dashes in this timeline, and that is all we can see. It's all we can know. We can never travel backwards in time. We can slowly move forward in time as we live and exist, but really all we have is the present. God, uh, I think that's why Scripture says that, um, makes reference to things that he did before the foundations of the earth, uh, because I think it's trying to get across to us that God is all the time in the present. Whether, whether something happened in the past, that's the present for God. Whether something is going to happen in the future, that's the present for God. Whether something's going to happen tomorrow, Tomorrow is the present for God. He exists outside of time. So time is our struggle. It's a uniquely human struggle that God, uh, he placed eternity in our hearts, and yet we struggle with our finite experience here in this human life. So that's a lot of what you pick up from this passage here. Let's just do this. Let's start out by just reading it. Uh, if you grab your Bible, I'm going to read it right out of the book here. I think this is the Holman Christian Standard uh, version in the in the uh, Sunday School books here. Uh, so it's Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 15. And it says, There is an occasion for everything and a time for every activity under heaven, a time to give birth and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to avoid, avoid embracing, a time to search and a time to count as lost, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. 
And so that's where the song part of it ends. Like that's poetry up to that point. And then the author, Solomon, we assume here, jumps in with, with a thought. What does the worker gain from all his struggles? I have seen the task that God has given the children of Adam to keep them occupied. He has made everything appropriate in its time. He has also put eternity in their hearts. But no one can discover the work God has done from beginning to end. So right there we see, again, reference to this idea that he put eternity in our hearts, but he doesn't allow us to see eternally into the future and eternally into the past like he does. We are constricted by time. Um, it says, uh, no one can discover the work that God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for them than to rejoice and enjoy the good life. It is also the gift of God whenever anyone eats, drinks, and enjoys all his efforts. I know that God, that everything God does will last forever. There is no adding to it and no taking away from it. God works so that people will be in awe of him. Whatever is has already been, and whatever will be already is. Wow, it's pretty intense. However, God seeks justice for the persecuted. So clearly, you know, what we're, what we're seeing there, whatever is has already been and whatever will be already is, is somewhat reference to God's sovereignty. Uh, Solomon, you know, he's obviously acknowledging that, look, whatever happened is what God, or, is, God ordained and was, was okay with, and whatever's going to happen is what God ordained and is okay with, because he's God, uh, and it's, you know, he's in control. Um, so verses uh, 9 through 15, are, they're not an extension of the psalm. Uh, in 1 through 8. However, Solomon is very intentionally contrasting his time psalm with the statement that he immediately quickly follows it with that he has put eternity in their hearts. So verse 9 is kind of like a heading. Uh, it's like saying, back to the topic at hand now. So he he gives us this, this song about time and seasons of life in verses 1 through 8, and then he kind of says, okay, all right, back to what we're talking about. Let me tie this together for you. Um, we look at verse 11. I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation. And yeah, I know we could have discussions about translations. They're, they're useful for different purposes. Uh, New Living Translation is, is an interesting way to read this, this verse saying, Yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. The sentence means that God has made the whole or everything. A better translation of the Hebrew word like would be like the whole earth there, the word everything. God has made the whole earth beautiful and it has its own season. Everything in the whole earth has its own season. So in other words, nothing lasts forever. Not the earth, not the sky. Nothing in our created world is forever. It's it's creation. Uh, it has a time. The guy says, in fact, here it says uh, it's beautiful and has its own time. So, uh, but here's Solomon's great irony. There is a time for everything under heaven, and yet God has planted eternity in the human heart. So it seems God intentionally put us in a plane of existence with just enough knowledge to know that this world is not enough for us, but... As you may well know if you've lived enough years to realize that every year you get older, the, the more things you don't know, uh, he also didn't give us all of the information to know very much about what eternity is going to be like outside of being with him and it being fulfilling. Uh, you know, we, we know very little about, about what's going to be after our earthly life. Um, so God has not shown us everything from beginning to end. Uh, C.S. Lewis has a great quote, probably one of my favorite quotes, uh, when he's discussing the fact that uh, it may have been from Mere Christianity. I'd have to think about which which book it was from or which radio address that he did. But he makes reference to the fact that there's always a tension in all human beings, whether they're believers or not. Uh, they're looking for something more than themselves, something sacred, something transcendent. And the way he says it is, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. 
so he's basically saying that restlessness, that angst that all people have uh, about their finite mortal existence, uh, that yearning for something more permanent, more almost, you know, more true probably is what a lot of people feel uh, than just the things they see. They're looking for something more real, more permanent, more true, something transcendent, something eternal. Uh, And so there's that struggle there. So uh, here's hope. Here's the hope. Yes, we live in the drudgery of a sin-cursed world in which life can seem to be an endless circle, but God has given the hope of eternity in our hearts. So he has not revealed everything, but he has revealed enough for us to know that there is a better world waiting for us for those who fully trust in Jesus for salvation. So, uh, you know, there's some interesting things to think about, um, about what the people who were reading this at the time it was written, how they would have thought about this. And, you know, Solomon was obviously known for being extremely wise, but really in, in, in some sense from a New Testament perspective, uh, we are much more wise than Solomon because, I mean, wise to the information, wise to the scope of life, because all Solomon would have had was maybe Genesis and maybe a little other Old Testament literature at this point. We have the entirety of the canon of Scripture from start to, to finish. We have Genesis all the way through to Revelation. So we are, are fortunate and blessed enough to live at a time in history, uh, a season, uh, if you will, just like this says, where we can see much more of the beginning to the end that, that, that Scripture refers to here. We obviously don't know everything, but we certainly have a much broader view of what God's plan is, at least for human history on the earth. Uh, we can see it. You can read it from Genesis to Revelation. Um, so verses 12 through 13 is also very positive. Uh, people think of it sometimes the wrong way, eat, drink, and be merry. They think of that as just partying, getting drunk. That's not really what the author's saying here. It's, he's saying in a positive way, eat, drink, and be merry, uh, because with thanks to God for those good things, we can celebrate and enjoy the good things in life together in a godly way. So he's not saying, you know, in a silly, trivial way, oh, eat, drink, and be merry, you know, Irish drinking song. It's not that type of, not that type of attitude. It's, it's literally saying, enjoy the good things in life. Enjoy the things you can enjoy amidst the tragedy and the hard times and the, the loss and the afflictions and the diseases and the aging and the hard work and the harsh weather. I mean, There's a lot that is negative uh, in this sin-broken world, but there is good things, and it's the simple things in life. Like like a lot of people, you you hear that phrase, it's the simple things. It really is. Here, he lists, have a good meal, you know, uh, have something to drink, be merry. Uh, So, you know, enjoying the the simple pleasures of life, food, beverages, beverages. being married probably, you know, obviously for most people means being with their friends and family. So, uh, again, we, we look at, there is things we can celebrate together, even in the difficult, uh, times. So, uh, verse 14, uh, God's work is eternal and no one can affect it. That's why we should fear, respect, and honor him. I mean, it's very clear there where it says, I know that everything God does will last forever. There is no adding to it and no taking from it. God works so that people will be in awe of him. Um, Verse 15, uh, the Hebrew is (laughs) really difficult there. Um, Even most Hebrew scholars disagree some with each other on exactly how to interpret that. We read it here in the Holman Christian Standard as whatever is, has already been, and whatever will be, already is. However, God seeks justice for the persecuted. That Even in the English, that is a difficult sentence to understand because you look at it and you go, well, if whatever is has already been and whatever will be already is, 
then how does God seek justice for the persecuted? Because it seems to sort of imply to, to our eye and ear the idea that everything is already determined and set in stone. That's a really heady verse to get into. And honestly, if you had the time, uh, we, you know, you obviously don't have that time in your life group. Uh, we don't have the time even here in this video. You could take half an hour and just dive into that verse and look up commentaries on it, look up things uh, online uh, on the Google machine, and uh, try to get your head around that verse. So that's that might be just a fun rabbit for you to chase uh, if you if you get through studying the rest of the lesson and you've got some time to really focus on just that verse. You might you might go digging uh, in some uh, online commentaries and things like that that are reputable. Uh, and just trying to get your head more around what that passage, what that that verse is saying in the in the passage. But I think I think what jumps out is just the idea that I I think what the author is trying to say there is that the past and the future are the same to God. So I think that's I think what that that verse is trying to convey. Uh, which again, like I said, you know, you're translating thousands year old Hebrew into 2000 uh, era modern English. There's so much that, that gets lost in translation sometimes as far as nuance of culture and language and all that. But I think the purpose here is saying the past and the future are the same to God. He is over the past. He is over the future. He is in the present. They are all the present to him because he is not bound to a lifespan like we are. God does not say, oh, 10 years ago when I was this, or hopefully 10 years ago when I'll, I will be that like we do. God doesn't do that. God just exists. So 10 years ago is the present to him. 10 years from now is the present to him. Right now is the present to him. He is present. He's omnipresent. So uh, God will demand an accounting of all that ends up being the past. I think that's what the second half of that verse is getting at. It's saying whatever is has already been and whatever will be already is, meaning that to God, everything eventually, uh, for us, eventually everything will be past. If you get far enough down the, the road past the book of Revelation, all of human history will have been passed at that point. And I think it's saying that at that point, um, God will demand an account. In fact, we see uh, in Scripture it's saying that at the end of all things that we'll stand before uh, his throne and there will be an account given. So I think that's kind of a uh, really, really lightweight explanation of that verse, um, just because there's so much you could get into with that. And we just don't have obviously the, the time to spend a whole Sunday school lesson really like just parsing that out and, and digging in on that. But I think that's sort of the idea there. Uh, so really anywhere you stop in this lesson or in this passage and camp out has something to do with time. That's what we keep coming back to. Even that last verse, you know, it's talking about whatever has been, whatever will be, it's time. So, again, follow the book, uh, read the side notes in there, look in the back with the ideas for, uh, for the teachers, uh, for, the, for the things you could do for conversation, prodders, and things like that. Uh, and maybe, you know, if you need some extra ideas, refer back to this video. Uh, really keep the concept of time in the forefront of your mind, time and seasons like the book talks about. Uh, and just remember that as we go all throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, that is sort of the thing that we see is, is you see uh, Solomon saying, as you know, obviously he's an older man when he wrote this or whoever wrote this got this, these sayings and, and uh, thoughts from him as an older man because he's looking back on his life. And it, it's obvious that we, we see that he realizes that outside of God, uh, everything is meaningless. I mean, it's just all there is to it. It's not a real pleasant thought uh, for people who don't believe in God. Uh, but for those of us who, who trust in the Lord, uh, there's comfort in that because we, we can go, okay, <coughs> all of this rigmarole, all of the monotony of our life, the daily grind, the repetitive nature, it has meaning because God 
is watching, God is interacting, and in the end, he is going to demand an account for all this. So what we do does matter. He seeks justice. So, you know, so those are just some thoughts. Uh, like I said, we hope you guys have a great lesson. We hope that you're able to uh, incorporate some of this into your teaching. Uh, and again, like I said, dig into your book. This is a great book. The lessons are so well laid out. Uh, and we hope you all have a great week, and we'll just see you all soon.